Hey, good uh, afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this, the uh, second edition of The Doctor Will See You Now. We're, we're doing this one a little bit different uh, in that we, we have shifted gears from the medical doctor uh, and shifted into the financial doctor uh, and the tax doctor. Uh, as many of you know, last week, Congress and the president signed off on a, uh, a bill to bring stimulus to the United States and our economy. The bill covers a lot of things, uh, everything from small business incentives to uh, benefits for individuals, self-employed persons, contractors, large business, you name it, uh, the Congress addressed it. But there's a lot of questions, and as what we often find uh, when it comes to legislation, the Congress uh, will pass something and then figure out, oh my gosh, now what do we do? How do we actually implement it? And so we've had a lot of questions at, at, at GDP Advisors this past week from clients of how do I access benefits? How do I get what I need? And so I turn to the person that I go to as an expert in that field, and that's Joshua Jensen. And so better known as JJ the CPA, uh, JJ is a friend of mine who I've known for some time. I'm a big fan of his, which is cool that you can be friends with somebody you're a fan of. Uh, he's a regular on Fox News as well as Newsmax and many other outlets. He's written a book, uh, so pick that up. If you're not subscribed to his YouTube channel, his Facebook channel, his LinkedIn channel, do that because you're going to find lots of information uh, all the time about uh, from, from him. And so I'm going to take a minute, and, I, and I'll just kind of give you a little background on JJ as we introduce him. He's been in the business for 27 years. Uh, you'll look at him. Start, he started when he was 12, uh, <laughs> if he's been in it that long. Uh, in the, just this past year, he's such a, such a well-respected and, and desired speaker that he has traveled over 50 cities in the last 18 months. Uh, he has authored the book, J.J. the CPA is Here, uh, or I'm sorry, J.J. the CPA is Here, uh, which was the top 60 questions from his clients and solutions over those 27 years. And so with that, J.J., welcome to the tax doctor. We'll see you now. <clears throat> I love it. I love it. Um, we are excited to be a part of this, Seth. Um, I know that you are an expert in what you do, and you provide a lot of help. <clears throat> it's an honor to be on the show. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, from my perspective, I've just been in a position where I'm wanting to help as many people as I can. And there are a ton of questions with this. There's a lot of concern. I don't want to say there's lives at stake, but there is livelihood uh, at stake. But, you know, when I watch you, Seth, on the different news outlets and with your podcast and your videos and following you on social media, there's really no one like you that you're in this industry that the coronavirus is absolutely um, becoming front and center, uh, obviously, in the in the health industry and uh it's uh, refreshing to see that somebody that's a part of it, but not it, not not the medical side, so to speak, but that's a part of the industry is getting good information out there. And so it's great to be on this on the program with you. Well, thank you. I appreciate that, my friend. And uh, um, and and I'm going to ask folks as you as you notice, our our we're not in the studio today. We're we're doing our social distancing. We're doing our part. Uh, but part of that also is that we're uh, working through some technical issues. So if, if, you, if you're experiencing those, I do apologize. We'll work through those. I'm at my home office. JJ's at his home office. Andrew's back at the studio trying to work through all of this. So as we work through this today, I'll just ask that you bear with us uh, through this. Andrew, real quick, are we getting feedback in, in, in my ear? Um, maybe we can fix that. Uh, maybe it's just feedback from the speakers. Um, so uh, let's just kind of kick off. And again, if you're following us on Facebook, YouTube, wherever, uh, I am actually uh, going to don't don't think I'm looking away from JJ, but we're figuring out the monitor thing. Uh, but I'm looking back to also see questions that are going to be coming in. So we've got this going live on Facebook. We have it live on YouTube. If you have a question, please type it in. If you're a business owner, self-employed contractor, just an American citizen wondering about your stimulus check. When's it coming? How's it coming? You know, feel free to to type in those questions, and and we'll 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 try to address them. Um, 
JJ, I'm, I'm going to kind of kick it off with one question. I've kind of typed up my own because, you know, listen, I'm a business owner and, and I've got my own slew of questions that I'm trying to, trying to work through. So let me just kind of kick it off with just kind of what you're seeing. I'm, I'm just curious, in the last couple of weeks since really we've seen this, this COVID pandemic uh, and the economy come to just what is a halt, uh, how many in the last three weeks, how many businesses have you seen just kind of throw it up and say, hey, we're out? You know, it's shocking because, you know, five weeks ago, we would never be guessing this, but it doesn't sound like a big number, but just even based on my own client list, I'd, I'd predict 5%. Of course, there's no hard data on that. And what I'm talking about on failure is like, I'm hanging it up. I mean, I was visiting yesterday uh, with a small diner in one of the rural cities, and this diner is a second generation and they were already a little bit in a position where they, you know, needed every dollar coming in every day. And the landlord that they're dealing with is not going to be as uh, forgiving as you will. And the employees are having to do something different. And uh, it was disheartening. Uh, and then last uh, Friday, uh, it literally brought me to tears. I don't mind admitting that. Um, a, a third generation business and they're letting go of all of their staff and uh, staff that have been with them for 15 and 20 years. Um, they about a year ago did a restructure and they're not in the same cash position that they were. And of course, no one would have guessed this. Um, so yeah, it, it, it doesn't sound like, it doesn't sound like a lot, but if you really think about 5% of businesses that aren't going to open up when we're coming back out into the world two months from now. That's a high percentage and it's only going to go up. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about, let's just start breaking down, if that's okay, the the stimulus. Yeah. Because, uh, man, there's a lot in there. Over 800 pages. I know you read it. Yep. Uh, I read it. Uh, yep. As most things that come out of Congress, it was a page turner. Uh, but you got to get through all the legal speak and really try to determine kind of what's all in it. But I think there's a lot of confusion. And, and you and I were talking before we went live. The, the news media really isn't covering this as far as what business owners need to know, what individuals need to know. I mean, they're obviously doing what the news media does well, focusing on the soundbite stories. Uh, but they're not focusing on really the information that maybe the American citizen needs to know. So why don't we start with maybe small business? Because I think that's probably a lot of the people that are joining us today. There are There are really two options for small businesses to gain access to money, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, so why don't we walk through what those two options are? So the main option really that's going to provide the biggest amount of relief is what's called the Paycheck Protection Program, otherwise known as the PPP. I've called it the triple P. Um, and what that is, in essence, is giving employers money. And when I say give, literally give, employer's money. And if I were to really boil it down, it's an employer's last 12 months of payroll costs and things related to payroll costs like insurance for the employees. You take that last 12 months of total cost, divide it by 12. So now you're arriving at an average monthly cost times two and a half, right? So if you have a business and their annual costs of salary and benefits and state unemployment tax and employer match is $360,000. Take that divided by 12, it's 30,000. That's their average monthly. What they can get maximum from the triple P is two and a half times of that, which would be $75,000. One of the things about it is that it is forgivable to the extent of what you spend in the eight weeks following approval on qualified expenses, qualified expenses being what I just indicated related to payroll plus rent, utilities, and interest on business loans in that business name. A couple of things that are in the details is you are looking at forgiveness, only 75% of what you receive um, can be used for payroll for that amount to be forgiven. So not to overwhelm the numbers, because I know I'm a numbers guy, but you know, if you're in a situation where what you borrow is 100,000, if you gave 75,000 to employment and 25,000 to rent, utilities, mortgage, uh, interest, interest, um, the rest of that 
all of it would be forgiven, Seth, if you spent that within the eight week period. The second thing is what's called the EIDL. So that's the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. And the only way you get that, and that's through the SBA website, um, and they've got a $10,000 immediate, get it in about 72 hours, if not sooner. They've got a next step up, which is an SBA Express that you can get up to 25,000. But here's the biggest key to know, Seth, is that to get the triple P, it is only through the bank, period. To get the EIDL or the SBA Express, that is only at sba.gov. The next thing to know is that the, the EIDL was in existence before the CARES Act, right? So the reason that there's confusion here is people think, and I did a video on this last night, people think SBA and there's really just one loan here, right? Because if you're not familiar with it, well, SBA, that'd be like saying, hey, Seth, I'll take a soda. And you go, great, what flavor do you want? So SBA is providing these. But I'm recommending to my clients to go and get the triple P if their payroll in total is over 48000 Because if it's less than 48000 I did a video on this, you're going to actually get more from the EIDL. So if, if people are saying, well, how do I know which one to get? The EIDL is up to 10 grand. You don't pay it back. And so if your total payroll is less than 48 or if you're self-employed and your net is less than 48, go get the EIDL. It's quicker. It's faster. You don't pay it back. The PPP you get through the bank and to know how much is forgivable is a little unknown because it will depend on what you spend. And then I'll just say before you tackle me with the next question is that on the PPP, um, whatever you don't spend in that eight weeks and or whatever you don't spend on the qualified expenses, you do have to pay back. But check this out. They just announced 48 hours ago that the loan rate on the payback of the triple P is a half a percent. Wow. Um, and that's caused the banks to look at this very differently, though, and not in a positive way. And over 10 years and your payments don't start for six to 12 months after you get this loan. So there is definitely a lot of relief there. And there's a couple other caveats that, uh, that are helping employers. My concern is, is it too late to get it to the employees? Yeah, and, and so I wanna kind of package up a couple of questions that I've gotten. Likely there's some that are typing in this question too, which is, you know, from a perspective of there's two there's two components, and maybe let's address this one first. Is there a benefit to applying for both, or am I penalized for applying for both? Or yeah, great, I, and I appreciate that because I'm not kidding. I've probably done five videos on this just to try and talk about it a different way, but they're both for the same purpose. And so the problem is, is that if you borrow from both, here's how it works in a nutshell. If you go and get your 10 grand from the EIDL, which is on the SBA.gov, and then you go and get a triple P, which is very possible, Seth, because people may have went and got that EIDL before the triple P came out, which quite frankly, hasn't even been a week, okay? A week ago at 4 p.m., the CARES Act and the triple P came into play. But let me go back to that example that I was giving you where someone qualified for $75,000 in triple P money. Well, if they went and got $10,000 from the EIDL, when they go to get their triple P, $10,000 will be subtracted from the amount they're giving. Now, this is where everybody seems to stop listening, but it makes sense to go, okay, well, if, if they're the same purpose, I get 75 on the triple P, I got 10 from the EIDL, so it makes sense. I'm only going to get 65 on the triple P, but here is the catch, okay? Guaranteed, though, the 65,000 that you got on the triple P, 10,000 of it will not be forgivable, right? So when I've got clients this week saying, hey, should I get the triple P, EIDL? Should I get both? I think I can get the EIDL and I can get money by Friday. I'm saying time out because you're gonna probably have your triple P money, let's say next week, 
And what's happened is if you qualify for 75, you have a great chance that all 75,000 of that will become forgivable. If you run out and get an EIDL, when it's all said and done, you still got 75 grand, but you guaranteed yourself that 10,000 of it will not be forgivable. So at the end of the day, you're going to owe 10 grand that maybe you otherwise wouldn't. So it's because it's for the same purpose, Seth. That, that's why it works that way. Okay. Interesting. So, I mean, from what I hear you saying, and I'm just going to kind of, that they're both available. It's not in your advantage to try to go get them both, right? You want to pick one or the other. Uh, the, the triple P, it sounds like, and maybe this is an opinion, do you think the triple P is going to be the one that most people will try to want to go after? Yeah. And this is where, um, I was, you know, this video I put together, if the total wages is less than 48,000 or the self-employment income is less than 48,000, go get the EIDL. And then 100%, the advice is if your total cost here, and I'm talking total for the year is above 48,000, go get a triple P period, the end, because you're going to get more, right? The EIDL is limited to 10 grand for starters, but you're going to get more out of the PPL and you're going to get more that then can be forgivable. Now here's the catch, right? So I know you were talking about businesses and what kind, and I know you'll, we'll get into that, but only on a triple P, uh, does it require wages? Okay. So I've had clients and they have a real estate business or um, they're in a circumstance where they just haven't paid themselves a wage and they're the only owner. So if you don't have wages, you're not going to get the triple P. And I mean, you're, you're not paying wages through your business. So then you just want to go get the EIDL and then move on to the SBA Express because that's not based on wages. Literally, the Paycheck Protection Program, keyword paycheck. Um, and so when you're looking at your qualified expenses, you know, Seth, I'm going to have clients that this is just a reality. Okay. The reality is they're going to get $52,000 on the triple P. And by the time they get it, they probably won't even have employees. Then they, they will have either had to shut operations or they can't reopen them. And so now it's the business owner got this money. That's not going to maybe go to the purpose that it's intended. And I don't, I, I know that, uh, I know that you don't mind if we get partisan a little bit, uh, in just a little bit, but it is unbelievable that we didn't have this solved two weeks ago because the Senate had it solved, uh, at this point, three weeks ago, Seth, they had this lined out and getting relief from stimulus checks, those stimulus checks that are going to individuals, probably another two weeks before they even arrive. That's a long time. Yeah. And, you know, I, listen, I've said a, lo a long time, you know, in the, over the last couple of weeks that, that Congress was putting the cart before the horse in that, you know, they really focused on getting unemployment insurance up and running. Um, but the problem is, is if you can keep people with getting their paycheck, they don't need unemployment insurance. Yep. And now we pass this bill that, quite frankly, requires employers to go back and either rehire these people yep. um, and put them back and take them off of unemployment, which, again, I think the vast majority of, of people would like. That people want a job. They don't want to collect unemployment insurance. But, and, but to your point, yeah, we, we kind of did one before the other, and, and, and yeah. we had them in reverse order. Right. That being said, and maybe that, that does lead me to the next question. So let's say I'm an employer. Let's say I've got 200 employees. I maybe I'm in the restaurant business or the entertainment business or, or, or someone that supports those businesses retail, and and I've had to let my people go because quite frankly the the cash flow faucet turned off, uh, and and I didn't have any money coming in, and I didn't want to prevent them from being able to get unemployment benefits. So I've let them go, but now I can get this triple P. But the caveat of that being forgivable is I need to have those people on payroll. What do I do? I go hire those people back. Do I reach back out and say, time out, come back and I'm going to pay you your paycheck. What, what do you suggest people do? Yeah. And that's, that is the quandary because you could bring your employees back, but they probably can't even come back to work. I mean, so you'd be paying employees that aren't doing anything. And here's what I wish was not the case, Seth. And I understand that the intention of the CARES Act in having that caveat that 
what's forgiven is what you spend within the eight weeks after the loan is approved. But if we're still closing down America for the most part and workers aren't going back, that eight weeks is not a fair amount of time because when I was counseling yesterday, this restaurant that I was telling you about, um, they felt like if we could, if people got back out, maybe they would be able to get people to come back to work, but it might be in, you know, May or in June. And this is where it doesn't match up. When you kind of talk about the cart before the horse, this is the other part that doesn't really match up is that you can apply for this through June 30, this, this triple P. And I think that they really, and, and initially it was going to be whatever you spent between loan approval and June 30, which would allow the employer time to rebound and then have money to pay employees to come back. So there's not a consistent incentive here. We kind of have this going on because the employer is going to get money that they got to spend in this amount of time, but it's going to be in this time period when they finally bring the employees back. And what will happen here is the employer is going to end up owing the money. It won't be forgivable. And that is why this restaurant decided to close because they're not going to have payroll to pay. And what will happen here is they'll get to this point and it'll be too late. They'll have to fail. And what they would have ended up with is a loan for nothing. So the, 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 the one thing that I hope maybe they revisit is that if employers spend the money between June 30, not just in eight weeks, because I predict that businesses will probably be back and doing something sometime in May, in June. I know uh, Governor of the Virginia said, hey, we're doing a stay home until June 10. Um, and they may very well do that, uh, Seth. And when you talk about 200 employees, that is a massive amount of money, right? And when you're getting the triple P, it's a look back last 12 months. So if you have 200 employees, you're talking millions of dollars in payroll. So you, ha you do have an employer, right, that's going to be able to, to get this money quickly and forgivable. But now what happens, and I'm just stating this in a different way, they've gotten all this money, but they have nothing to spend it on to make it forgivable. So then actually I have two other businesses. They don't even think they're going to get the money because they're not going to go out of business, but they're not going to be able to spend it in the eight weeks. And therefore it wouldn't be forgivable. And now it's just going to crush their business to then have a huge loan because they wouldn't have had anything to spend money on in the next eight weeks except rent and utilities. Now, let me just ask you, and I, and I recognize, I'm, here's the disclaimer, this is purely opinion, right? Because uh, there is nothing definitive here. But listen, Congress and the Department of Labor, the IRS, you name it, they're notorious for passing a bill, getting it out there, and then say, well, time out. Now we have to interpret this. I think the Affordable Care Act is a perfect example, right? There are literally thousands of pages of post, uh, you know, post bill, uh, interpretation. And so, uh, you know, in your opinion, as someone who, who studies this and watches it, do you think that they will ultimately come back and say, Hey, that eight weeks was not realistic. We're going, we're going to make it forgivable. We're going to expand it out. You know, just kind of what's your opinion there? Yes, absolutely. And you know why? Because that triple P that we've been talking about that just came in play last Friday and I do want to give kudos to the SBA because I've never seen a governmental agency move as quickly as they have. Um, they had applications out from a brand new loan uh, Tuesday afternoon. Here's the problem, though, Seth. They've already changed it three times. Um, we've got clients um, just in the, I've got the figure here, $1,986,000. Uh, is what I helped my clients apply for yesterday with banks so that the bank could just push the button today, like have everything ready to go, push it to fund it, so to speak. And then this morning, the SBA came out with a third application, and here's why I'm telling you that. It now is allowing you to apply for this up until September 30, where the law says, uh, June 30. So we already have our first change, right? They're expanding how long. But here's my here's my concern, though, 
is in the law they've appropriated, um, I, I, I want to say it's $349 billion, but now that sounds too high. But anyways, they've appropriated a very specific amount to the triple P, right? But what I've been telling clients is that money will probably be gone, believe it or not, in two weeks. Um, and here's a couple of reasons why um, the banks, in I'm very disappointed in this, are misinterpreting the aspect 1102 of, to get in the nitty gritty, section 1102 of this CARES Act, okay, when they're defining payroll costs. Congress said and, and they should have said or, right? And this and, it will make the money in this go probably at least twice as fast. And here's the and. Congress was clearly defining what payroll costs, and then they define what payroll costs are for the self-employed, right? I work for myself. I don't have an entity. I just make money and it goes on a Schedule C and I have a net income. So they were defining what is quote unquote payroll costs for self-employed, right? Not their, not what they would pay their employees, but, but most self-employed people, they don't have employees, right? They were defining it, but they said payroll costs is this that is wages, et cetera, and 1099s and all this stuff. And so banks are interpreting, some of them, that businesses get to borrow whatever it is they also pay independent contractors. Okay? So here's, here's why it's unfair. And also why it's going to make the money go twice as quick. Those independent contractors are able to apply for EIDL and Triple P. So if I'm an independent contractor, let's just say for a minute, I'm an independent contractor. I make $100,000, okay? Based on what we know now, I'm gonna take $100,000, I'm gonna divide it by 12 times two and a half, and I'm gonna go into a bank and I'm gonna get a loan for that amount under triple P. But the way that some of these banks thank, to some, thank you to some lawyers that think they're being cute here, the business will be able to borrow money to pay these same independent contractors makes no sense to me because the independent contractors can go get their own loan. And therefore, what happens is, don't tell me otherwise, I don't mean you, don't tell me otherwise because I'm already even hearing it from my own clients and I'm having to kind of do an ethical check with them here. But don't tell me for a minute all of a sudden, businesses are going to go ahead and go, hey, here's all the 1099s I paid out to the landscaper, to the cleaning person, to this consultant that I paid last year that I'm never going to pay again in my life. But if the bank's going to give me money because I'm in a crisis, I just jumped out of the plane, I have no parachute, here's a bank next to me, they're going to hand me a parachute, well, I want the biggest chute I can possibly get, right? So businesses are in a crisis so they're not thinking maybe the clearest, they're thinking survival mode. Survival mode is gimme, gimme as much as I can. Oh, I can get more? So now all of a sudden, if I get paid by a business, that 100,000, right? If I'm a self-employed individual, I can go get a loan based on my 100, but then that business is getting money based on the 100 they paid me is a double up, number one. Number two, that business is not going to pay me. Who do you first not pay? Independent contractors, right? right? Yeah. And then here's the other part of that, Seth, is that the independent contractors, self-employed sole proprietors, first time I know ever, they can go and file for unemployment. So there's now even another avenue. So I've, I've got a client and, you know, I'm, I'm literally at 1130 last night. I am walking around my office and I'm a little exasperated because their bank came back and said they can include the 1099s. And I'm trying to tell the client that that's not proper. I don't think that'll ultimately be what it is. And here's why I'm saying all this, Seth, is when you say, will there be changes and will it be allowed? And I think the money runs out before we're even to the eight week period. And so then it's a mute point. 
It's an absolute mute point. And if you've told people, hey, here's $52,000 dentist with three employees, you got to spend it in eight weeks, then the, de the dentist is going to spend it. And then they're going to get passed and it's not forgivable. They can't go back for more. So don't get me wrong. This is a beautiful program. What I would recommend they change is take that eight weeks out, maybe make it 12 weeks or 16 weeks. Because now when you're giving basically money to a small business that's trying to survive, um, I have clients that, and I don't think there's any problem with this, they're saying, I don't care if I have to pay this back. I have no credit to go get any other monies. I'm completely out of money. I have nowhere to go. The triple P is uncollateralized. You don't have to guarantee it. It's based on payroll. So I've let everybody go. Okay. But I got bills. I'm already getting ready to be past due. I owe vendors. I'm going to get this money. So even though the money's based on payroll, they're getting this money. And the only thing that's going to happen here, Seth, is whatever it is they don't spend on payroll, then they have to pay back. Well, who cares? It's a point. It's a half a percent loan. Right. So my point in saying that is there's going to be small businesses borrowing the money, right, as much as they can. And it's not going to even go to the employees, not because these are bad individuals or, or, or big bad wolf or greedy business owners. But if your business is already closed and you're behind on a bunch of other bills, well, what are you going to do as a business owner? You're going to pay your old bills and your employees are going to get unemployment. And it's been amazing how many, uh, how much analysis I've helped clients with in the last week of, do I let them go so they can collect unemployment? Do I wait for the triple P? Because all I'm doing with the triple P is I'm, I'm going to get money just to pay them. It doesn't really help me, but but it does, though, right? I mean, and I'm not, I'm not disagreeing, but there is an advantage here, though, of making sure that your employees are on payroll with their health insurance, by the way, because, right, you go to unemployment insurance, you don't have health insurance. And so the value of the triple P is that it's going to cover their health insurance expenditure, allow them to keep that, which during a health pandemic, don't we kind of want to keep our employees' health insurance in place? Um, right. You know, and it is going to help with that payroll. So there is an advantage, especially to those businesses who say, I'm going to reopen. I, I'm going to get this business back in place to get that triple P money to keep their people on payroll. Or if they've let them go, bring them back and use that money. Right. Yes. I, so I'll continue to I agree, but I disagree with what you're saying in the sense of the business owner is looking at it as an advantage but if they're still closed, yes, they want to keep their employees on. But, but here's the only reason I disagree with you is that the analysis that I'm doing with these clients is wouldn't my employees just be better off getting on unemployment while we're closed because they qualify for it? Then I hold on to this money, okay, that when they do come back, I have it, okay, but then the disadvantage is they then have to pay it back. And so, right. yes, I think that'll change a pure opinion. But now let's now let's think right now. You're sitting with a you're smitting, you're sitting with a small business owner that probably has less than 250,000 in retirement. Okay? They've got maybe 25,000 in the bank. They might have 50,000 available on a line of credit. Not to mention they got to take care of their own bills at home, right? And they're sitting here going, I don't know when we're reopening. Some states it's say in June, some it might be in a few weeks, some think it's a farce. But we have a crystal ball here. So what if, this is the business owner thinking smartly, what if I go ahead, I let my employees go collect unemployment so I can save this money to be able to pay them when I'm reopening. But what if I can't reopen? I mean, the ones that say, hey, I'm planning on reopening and they're in an industry, let's say uh, the medical industry, right? Because not all medical is essential. Yes, when they reopen, they're going to have a flood, right, of people that are coming back in. The, here's the biggest thing, though, is those individuals are going, well, I don't know if I want to borrow the money anyways, because um, maybe I don't need as many employees. And probably half of the clients I'm working with, Dustin, uh, uh, Dustin, Seth, is um, that um, the analysis right now is, I don't even know, you know, this is the, the clients. I don't know that I actually need all these employees, 
you know, now that I'm really looking at this and what are my costs and I'm now home and I'm looking over and um, I've had a number of small businesses that have decided, you know what, this is probably a good time because the employee is going to qualify for more benefits with the federal government. Um, and so I'm just going to go ahead and let that employee go now and permanently because even though I know I'm going to open my doors back up, here's, here's, I know it's a woulda, coulda, shoulda, but we would not be in this position if we would have known that CARES Act details three weeks ago and businesses had money last week. At this point, and you know, today was supposed to be opening day for loans getting submitted to the SBA for the triple P. I see no I see no way of that happening. I don't even know how it'd be possible because we have a new application from the SBA today, which I think was minorly a delay tactic. And the bankers that I'm talking to, and, and, and Seth, I'm talking to the presidents of the bank. And, and the only reason I'm saying that is being a business owner for a long time, most of these presidents, you know, 27 years ago, we were all, you know, snot nose, you know, just working our way up, right? So that's how I know them. And so I'm getting inside scoop and they're just like, the SBA is not giving us any guidelines how to even get them the info. How do we even get funding? So I don't see how it happens today, which then you know this is it probably finally gets figured out next Wednesday or Thursday, which means that money gets submitted at the end of the week. And at this point, we're now into mid-April, and that is eternity for small businesses, even if they're planning to reopen. Because remember when I was telling you they're sitting with their 25 grand in the bank, probably gone in a couple of weeks. They've got a line of credit. Maybe that's their last crutch. They've got bills to take care of, not to mention just bills sitting on the desk. You know, I created a, a survival guide. And if you don't mind, I created a website as, as purely a community service. Uh, you provide no information to get any of this. You can't even figure out how to contact me, but it's uh, COVID19taxhelp.com, COVID19taxhelp.com. And what I've got on that website is for individuals and businesses to sit down and this is what people need to do right now is figure out what's your cash position in 21 days and here's why. It might be really that that's when you're getting your triple P money. It could be it could be three weeks from now. It could be two weeks from now. So you need to know what shape are you going to be in in two to three weeks to then know how you should allocate that money. So with all this uncertainty, yes, it's an advantage, but the uncertainty is does the business end up with a loan that's not forgiven that maybe they should have waited to get, but if they keep waiting, the money's going to run out? So, in, in, you know, I definitely want to get to some of the questions uh, because they're coming in, uh, and I want to make sure we're cognizant of everybody's time. Uh, that being said, I, I, I'll add my own just kind of a, additional opinion to that, which is I agree, $350 billion is not enough. Uh, it's not even close to being enough. But I also agree that if history has taught us anything, it's that Congress doesn't mind printing more money. Uh, they don't mind going out and expanding uh, the stimulus. And, and, and likely the president, Congress, and alike know that given that the economic situation that we're in, that $350 billion becomes $700 billion very, very quickly. Yeah, you're right. And it'll be needed. And I will tell you this, I I wish somebody would come out and give these banks a whooping and these law firms that think they're, they're, they're helping the clients when they're going to crush this because probably a big factor in there is what I was telling you is that in the definition of payroll cost, they said and instead of or, and that and is going to add a ton more. Because I'll tell you this, um, the, there's no way that's the spirit of the law because the IRS crushes businesses that pay independent contractors when they should be employees. Right. Um, and so anyways, it, it's, it's crushing. It's going to be crushing to the dollar amount. And just the last comment is there are many businesses, they pay more to independent contractors than they do employees. So you might have somebody, they have 360000 in payroll. They were going to get a $75,000 loan. Now all of a sudden they're including 1099 people. 
their loan just went from 75, maybe up to $200,000. I will tell you this. I have two clients that I said, we're not doing it. I don't care if you can, you're not because it's not the spirit of the law and you were not doing it. It just, it's not right. Right. And isn't that there, there's a, it, and maybe I read this wrong, that there has to be a 25% loss. Uh, is, is there something in there that states that you have to have, and how do you prove that? Right. Because you may not run your financials. Uh, what, what is the process there? So the loss is related to the, um, uh, the employer retention credit. It's also related to, um, there's, a, there's another provision inside the um, CARES Act that's related to other SBA loans, and it's talking about forgiveness on that. But that's the, the, the triple P is not based on financials. Uh, it's not based on loss. Uh, the triple P is strictly based on how much money you spend of the loan. Um, but when you're looking at the other aspects, um, when you're when you're looking at the loss, it's actually based on the gross, uh, as I understand it. So it's 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 easier to prove, right? I mean, what did you gross versus if you paid a lot of expenses out because you you were behind on bills? It may look like you have a loss for the period, but it's only because you were past due. So that's based on uh, that's based on the dip. So um, let's talk about the application process. Uh, you said, you know, you've, you've been helping some of these clients be prepared so they can push the button and go. What, what all do I need to be, if I'm a business owner, if I'm a CFO, um, what, what do I need to be preparing and make sure that I have it at the ready? Yeah, great question. So uh, the first thing is that this is for 500 uh, or less employee businesses, okay? And they do look at affiliation. If you've got common uh, ownership, et cetera, they are going to look at this, but they do look at separate locations. You know, so if you have a business you know, across the nation, they're going to look at the different areas. So that'd be the first thing to know before you jump into the triple P. The next is it, it is 100% based on the payroll. So you need your 941s. That's what the banks are asking for, the Form 941s, which is your employer tax report, which indicates what your wages are. And right now, uh, what came out this morning is you can base it on what is called line one or line two. I'm recommending to clients to go with line three, which is the most pure number. The most pure amount of wages is uh, is on line uh, is on. I'm sorry, is on uh, line five C. Line five C. So when you're looking at what are your combined costs, it's going to be what your wages are on your 941. And then you have to look at what do you pay to the state for unemployment tax? And then you look at what does the employer pay, not the employee portion, the employer pay for health insurance. And then what was the employer match? And you're talking a 12 month period. So here's where we were Monday morning. The 12 months was literally the last 12 months. And then there was uh, a provision in the law that if you hadn't been in business during a period of time, you could do a short period. Then they define if you're seasonal. And then this morning, they've said, you know what? If you don't have, if you don't have first quarter uh, of 2020 ready to go, you can just base this on 2019. So. The thing that I did is last Thursday, we worked primarily with one specific uh, payroll processing company uh, here in Oklahoma City with our clients, Alliant. And uh, yesterday and the day before, they were cranking out everything that was needed because my clients could be then first in line in the sense that I literally have the last 12 months. But that's it. Um, now, some banks, and I've got some videos on this, Seth. JJ, the CPA is my channel, if you don't mind me mentioning. But... Um, I, I've, I've had a couple of, of, of very frustrated conversations into the camera that uh, banks are asking for financial statements, but there's no basis for that because there's literally no qualifications. It says in the law that the bank books these as a zero risk loan. The only qualifications are this, okay? And this is the most important because I've got... Um, uh, I've got five clients that after discussing it with them, they decided with me that they should not apply for this, but that might just be 
that they're lucky that we that we discussed it. But the first the first main thing, the requirement and the first qualification that you have to certify is that you are having an economic injury and you're not able to pay your employees. Right. And so you've got to have that. The second is you're saying I am going to pay employees with this. OK. The third is that you plan to retain employees, not just pay them. And then also you're certifying um, that whatever is not forgivable, you will pay back, but it's not even a guarantee. So when banks are asking for financial statements, three years worth, and uh, you know they're wanting additional details to the payroll, like monthly payroll, et cetera, my frustration in that, Seth, is that the the businesses need the money now to make somebody whose house is on fire and the hoses have arrived and the bank who's the one that hands the hoses out says, hey, wait a second, real quick, I, I need to see a copy of your homeowner's insurance. Um, I'd like to see your driver's license and let me go ahead and see, you know, three years worth of utility bills. OK, the house is burning down and now someone's having to run and get all this extra documentation that is not needed. Banks are completely off base. But you know what? I figured out why yesterday in talking to a few bankers and I did another video on it. I'm doing a daily update now on the this YouTube channel. But I think they're doing it because when the banks found out, and I'm not even saying that the banks are are are, are terrible for thinking this now, but when the banks woke up Tuesday morning and the government said, hey, the loans are not 4% like it says in the law, they're going to be a half a percent. Banks are like, okay, wait a second. So we're going to be booking loans here that if what's not forgivable, we got to carry this thing at a half a percent. Doesn't matter that it's guaranteed. Doesn't matter that it's getting funded. Banks have to carry the note, which, which affects their reserves, as you know. So I think, and this is what I've been counseling, um, and I've got, I've got two main banks that they're just requesting what's required. So what I'm telling people is if, if you're going to your bank and they hem-haw, they're not sure, they're not responding, they want all this additional information besides what I told you, which is 941s and insurance invoices. That's it. You need to move on to another bank because that bank's kind of subliminally telling you they don't really want your loan. Now, I do have one bank, and this is why I really kind of solved this yesterday. <clears throat> it's smart, but they're having their customer fill out a sheet showing how they plan to spend the money over the eight weeks because the bank's trying to figure out how much of it's going to be forgivable. Because if all of it's forgivable, then the bank doesn't have to carry a note and the bank clipped their 5% fee, which didn't cost the customer anything. They got their 5% fee. Client spends the money in eight weeks. Boom. So so let me, let, me, let me clarify this thing, because I think you just bring up a great point that many people probably aren't planning on is they're prepping their documents to go to their bank. You know, we say this all the time on the health insurance side of things. It's equally as important for me to sell you client to the health insurance company as a good risk as it is for me to try to sell the health insurance company to you as a good carrier. So, you know, from that perspective, if what I hear you say, if I'm planning for these documents, it's spoon feed the banker and say, hey, here's what I'm going to do with the money. Here's how I plan to make sure that it is forgivable. And these are the steps that I'm going to take. So when you're considering my loan, you go, this is a good one for us to take. Is that is yep. that kind of what I'm hearing you say? Absolutely. And what I've done is, so the clients that we're helping them with, we set up a Dropbox and we put everything in. And every time we hear another bank request something else, we just start putting that in the Dropbox for the client. So when they're going to their bank, if they decide they want this detail by month or quarter, and then, um, you know, that's a good point. I, had, I, hadn't, I hadn't talked to my clients about doing it for that purpose, um, but I've already told clients and I've created a spreadsheet. We need to start planning. How are you going to spend it? How do you track your expenses so that you can plan for how much is forgivable? But that's a great point, Seth. It might be that as the, as the client is figuring that out, maybe that that they throw that in there because we've already been doing that analysis because I've had a number of clients who are like, you know, I don't really want to borrow more than I, than I need. Um, now here's the problem with that. 
you may not know how much you need. Now here's the advantage to it though, and this is why I think that money will run out maybe a little faster, is that when you finish the eight weeks, what I told clients is, whatever you didn't spend and whatever isn't forgivable, well then you just, you just pay it back. Okay, but it doesn't replenish the fund. It doesn't go to the next person in line. Um, so it's a catch-22, um, but there's a number of clients who are like, you know, I don't really want a loan, but if I can use it for the purposes and then whatever I don't use, then I kick it back. But you're right, but I will say this, though, um, and, and I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna promote any banks other than to say, these national banks, they got it going on. They're gonna, and here's why. You can, you, can, you, can, you can sell these loans later, okay? So these, these big banks, they're gonna collect their 5% fee. Okay, no big deal, that's, that's just what it is. I mean, they can't deny the fee, but then they're just gonna package them up and sell them off, okay? And somebody's gonna buy them and go, no problem, I don't have to worry about reserves, I'm just gonna clip a half a percent on money that's guaranteed by the government, I basically have no risk. All to say that if, you're, if your local bank is hesitant, requiring a lot of documents, maybe jump on and talk with one of the national banks. Because I bet you by next week, uh, I, I predict at least two of them based on what they're doing. It'll be log on online. There'll be a way to verify your company and your identity. Fill this out. Boom, boom, like an ATM machine, which is really how this is meant to be. So you're, you're thinking that we're going to finally get this thing wired in pretty quick um, and that, that bank money will roll out. I think we've, we're both in alignment and agreement that uh, $350 billion isn't enough, but Congress right. is willing and the president will likely approve more uh, going into this. And that, you know, for the most part, get your, get your ducks in a row. Make sure you have a, a competent advisor guiding you through uh, your financials, um, and and as we say in the in the in our industry, a lot of times it's you want to be you want to be top of stack. In other words, the underwriters have, are going to have a lot of stuff to go through. Make yours the one that they go. Mm, let's look at that one because I'm spoon fed all the information. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, to that point, Seth, when the eight weeks is up, the customer has to go into the bank and say, "Here's how I did spend it." here are my receipts and literally in the law it states this here's my check copies here's my receipts here's my bank statements here's my payroll records they have to prove to the bank and i don't know that maybe the banks are starting to digest that but you know what you bring a great you, you make a great point there because if a bank's looking at it, it's like okay this should be a little smooth sailing on the back side um and and you know i my you know, three of my best friends are bankers. And so I, I, I can tease it this way, but it's like, that's a lot of work for bankers, right? To, to, to have to do something on the tail end, you know, they're getting a healthy 5%, quite frankly, for, you know, looking at some documents and popping it up and handing it out. Uh, I think the 5% is, is, is exorbitant and ridiculous, but it is what it is. Um, but now when they're looking at it and it's like, well, if we, you know, if this client's going to require not a lot of work at the end and this client's going to require a lot, I'm just going to take the client that's not going to require work at the end. And that's not maybe laziness, probably just smart. But that's why I'm also saying, you know, uh, if you got a bank and they're tripping you up a little bit, you might just, you know, pull up stakes and, and get to another bank. The only caveat there is uh, one of the banks that I'm sending really all of my clients to almost by the hour, we're adding another client that we're sending to, to my friend here, um, is, uh, you do have to become a customer of the bank, um, to be able to do business with that bank. So there's a little extra step to take, but you know, he just streamlined it. Um, the client shows up at their office and does all the things to establish it, get the loan, you know, signed. So, if you think you're going to use a bank, one of the big banks, then right now go open an account with them. I don't want to mention any of them, but you should, you know, think about it. What are the big banks out there? Well, go open an account with them like right now, because if you have the account, you're now a customer. And most importantly, they have an account to send the money to. So I've got, uh, I got one, and this will probably be the last question we get from, from people that are tuning in, and thanks for all the questions, uh, just because from a per perspective of time. Uh, Tracy writes in, um, 
what exactly are the expenses that can be paid other than utilities, such as bank fees, health insurance, retirement, business insurance, utilities, et cetera? Like, just real quick, go over those one more time. You got it. So the expenses that count for forgiveness is the payroll, the health insurance that the employer pays, the dental and the vision that the employer pays. No other kind of insurance counts. Utilities, but utilities do include internet and telephone. The employer match. Now that's not the employee withheld and it's not the safe harbor. It's not the big amounts, okay? It's the percentage, that's the match that we're talking about here. If there's a mortgage or a loan in the business, literally in the business name, not just paid by the business, then the amount of interest on that, not principal, but the amount of interest on that um, is included. And then the state unemployment taxes, what is spent on that, that's what is compiled into that, as well as rent, as well as rent. The, the one caveat I'll put in there is that it's not meant for this was my staff and here was my payroll, but I'm doing so good out of this, I'm gonna add, okay? This is not for expanding your business, it's for maintaining. So you can't use up forgivable amounts on adding staff, okay? It's for maintaining staff and rehiring, okay? And then when you're talking about rent, you know, for those that, uh, you know, rent from themselves in essence, uh, it clearly states in the law, basically whatever your rent was and your utilities and what you were signed up for and your loans, it's what you had in play on February 15th, 2020. So you can't just start paying rent, you can't pay rent in advance, and it be forgivable portions. But know this, when you're qualifying for the loan, okay, it does not include the interest, any of the utilities, does not include the rent, and um, does not include, I think I already said the interest. When you're qualifying for it, it's just the related payroll costs, hence, the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, but all I'll add there too, Seth, if you don't mind, is you'll need to have receipts, check copies, bank statements to back up what you spent. And when they, the reason they want check copies is they wanna see that you spent it in the eight weeks, not I owed it in the eight weeks and then I paid it nine weeks later. It has to be paid in that eight weeks. So that's why they want the check copies and then they can't just have check copies, they have to have a receipt to know that what you actually paid is a qualifying expense. So you gotta have both, so track them now. I'll be counseling my clients to do that immediately. Excellent, well JJ, as, as we're kind of wrapping up here in the closing minutes, just is there, are there any additional thoughts that you say, man, I really wish somebody would have asked me this or I wish this is the one thing additionally that I think people should know or be aware of? Yes, and it's two, and it's, a, it's additional help for the small business owner. One is very simple. You can, as a business owner, retroactive to 1-1 through 12-31-20, defer all of the employer portion of the Social Security taxes that the employer pays. That's a 6.2%. If you have a business and they have $300,000 in salaries, that is $18,000 in taxes that you can defer and pay half in 2021 20, and half in 22. The second is they added a fourth credit and it's called the employee retention credit. Really straightforward, which is if you're paying somebody that is out for any reason due to this crisis, any reason, and you're paying them up to $10,000 of their compensation, you get a 50% credit. Stated another way, you pay that employee who's out 10,000 bucks, you're getting a $5,000 tax credit. But I'll say overall, here's what everybody's missing on the three credits that came out of the Family First Coronavirus Tax Act, and then this fourth credit that came out of the CARES Act. The way that you get the credit, Seth, and this is why I'm just, I'm just jump up and down because it doesn't seem like it's getting through the way that you actually experience the immediateness of the relief it's intended for those is that it's an immediate reduction in the payroll tax that you pay to the IRS. And the IRS on their website literally states, if your payroll tax that you owe to the IRS is $10,000 
and you have $4,000 in tax credits, you will only send in $6,000. If you owe 10 and you have 4,000 in credit, you're only going to send in six grand. You immediately got the benefit of that. If you miss it, you got to wait till you file a 941. The IRS indicated that they're going to come out with some form to get that. Here's, here, here's how you avoid all that, Seth. Know your credit. So I have a worksheet, uh, COVID19taxhelp.com. It's all free. I have a worksheet on there on how to calculate the three credits. I haven't added the fourth credit yet because I'm, I'm literally going on two to three hours of sleep probably for the last seven nights. I'm trying to do all I can to not only help my clients, but it's kind of turned into my, my videos that I'm doing. I'm usually starting those at about 2 a.m. that I'm putting up on, on YouTube, but I feel like there's just additional information to get out there. Well, listen, I, I think I caught you on Fox News the other day at 2 a.m., so you were up anyway. I, I was. I, I appreciate it, so. that. That's right. <laughs> well, listen, JJ, man, thank you so much for the time. I know our clients, our friends, our subscribers appreciate that. Uh, do us a favor. If you are watching this video right now, first of all, subscribe to what we're doing. That way you can be alerted when we have updates. Then flip over to JJ's page, whether that's on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, you name it, uh, and subscribe because as he updates things, you'll be notified of those things. And then JJ, one more time, give us those that website that, that, that we can go to to get information. Yeah, you bet. And uh, thank you for the, for the encouragement to come and uh, follow and subscribe because on all social media, just put in JJ, the CPA, but then the website is www.covid19 taxhelp.com and uh, the resources are there just to help. So thank you so much for having me on. It's, it's truly an honor and uh, I appreciate that we can and, uh, you know, help and spread the word about some of these wonderful t tax and uh, financial economic reliefs that are coming down the, coming down the pipe. Thanks, JJ. And uh, thanks to everybody at GDP Advisors that helps support uh, getting this video out there. If you're a client of GDP Advisors, please reach out to your team if you have questions or need help. If you're not a client, we'd welcome you to the family. A uh, big thanks to Andrew Clark back at the mothership trying to get all this sorted out from a technology perspective. I actually think the tech went better today with me here in JJ in Oklahoma City. So maybe that's just uh, us kind of fine tuning what we're doing. Stay tuned next week. Uh, same bat time, same bat channel. We're going to do this again. Uh, another version of The Doctor will see you now. And I think we've got Dr. Rankins back with us next week. And then we'll work on kind of what we do then. We may bring JJ back if we've got some more information that, that needs to get out to you. But uh, JJ, again, thanks for your time. For all those that tuned in, uh, thank you for your time. Stay well. We love you. We'll talk to you soon.